So, hello, and, um, and welcome to the last but one uh, lecture in this overheating course. Um, we're sort of, uh, sort of approaching the end slowly of this course, and as you know, there's going to be an exam um, in a few weeks' time. And, uh, well, independently of the exam, if there are any questions, I mean, you've been fairly quiet, okay? So, questions, comments, anything, think about it. Next week, no, there's not going to be a lecture next week, okay? But, so that's going to be a reading week. But in two weeks, uh, Astri Stensu will come and talk about the anthropology of climate change. And I'm also going to come in and uh, make a sort of summary of some of the main, as it were, topics and themes that we've been taking on uh, during this course towards the end of, of that lecture in, in two weeks. And that's going to be the end. So um, today I'm going to talk about an important topic which uh, stirs up a lot of engagement around the world, but which is still somewhat understudied by anthropologists, namely that of invasive species, species invasion. But before that, just one little remark about last week. As you notice, I've now reverted to my, to my old ways of using the, the blackboard and the, and the piece of chalk. And uh, I think, you know, I think I, I've been trying, I tried a few years ago too to use PowerPoint-like presentations and it doesn't seem to agree with me, okay? So maybe I'm just an old-fashioned, old-school kind, of, uh, kind of teacher. There is something distractive about it, which in, in a way is a shame because today, uh, as we're going to talk about invasive species, it's a very photogenic um, kind of uh, topic, okay? But there are lots of YouTube films, tiny films, and you're also getting a film after the lecture, and I hope that most, if not all of you, will be able to, to watch the film. It's a, it's a very powerful film about an invasive species, or rather an introduced species, which turned invasive after a few years in Lake Victoria, which shows that invasive species are far too important to be left to activists and biologists. They need to be studied carefully by social scientists, such as anthropologists, because of their entanglements with power relations, with inequality, with cultural values, and with people's ways of life in, in local communities. So there is a very strong cultural, political, social dimension with invasive species, or what we call invasive species. I'm coming to that in a, in a moment. What do we call invasive species? And why is it that some species are just introduced, uh, whereas others are invasives and, and invading? It's a, it's a rather pejorative term to talk about the species as being invading. And uh, there is a reason for this. But first of all, I just have to add a small appendix to uh, last week's lecture about energy because there is a rather important thing uh, that I somehow didn't get around to saying properly about um, especially Leslie White's perspective on energy. I mean you would remember that according to White uh, you could somehow gauge the what he calls the cultural evolution or what we might call the complexity of a society by looking at the amount of energy that it's uh, capable of harnessing and exploiting for, for human use. Uh, so, uh, in other words, his story is a simple evolutionary one. But there is another aspect of this which is not taken up by, by White, but which has become increasingly important today as we are concerned, more and more of us are concerned with the unintentional side effects of modernity and industrial development on the environment and on climate and so on. And that is to do with the fact that the more energy you use and the more energy you make yourself dependent on, uh, the less flexible you become in some ways. I mean, flexibility is a, is a complicated concept which, uh, which comes up, I mean, it crops up in in some of the other topics that we're talking about in this course, flexibility defined by Gregory Bateson as uncommitted potential for change. Uncommitted potential for change. It's a very simple definition. In other words, flexibility is the kind of um, possibilities that you have or a society has to do things differently. Flexibility is whatever you can do differently. So in other words, it's your range of options. <coughs> and the more energy you use and the more energy you become dependent on, the less are your options in the future for using less energy. 
unless you change other aspects of society. And this is one of the dilemmas facing, in many ways, the world today, and certainly the developed, as it were, world, the rich world, which uses most of the energy. That uh, It's very hard for us to imagine here a return to a low-energy society. And this is one of the big challenges of the 21st century, certainly in the rich world. I mean, in the poor countries, it's very different. As I mentioned uh, last week, in, in, the, in a continent like Africa, most of Africa is not really a net contributor to climate change in any significant way. But they are, of course, the victims of climate change in many ways. And in most of Africa, the problem is not too much energy. It's not the fact that they use too much energy, but, they don't have, but that they don't have enough. So they can't have uh, the lights on, for example. I mean, they don't have the kind of many parts of Africa that don't have electric lights, um, which is uh, detrimental to productivity, to children's homework, to various kinds of activities that might take place after dark. So um, that's that part of the world. But in our part of the world, there is an uh, increasing loss of flexibility with uh, a certain form of complexity. And one could also not only talk about energy use, but we could also talk about other forms of complexity which reduce the options for the future. And let me just give you one small example. The Green Revolution in India, um, which was um, a blessing for many Indians, for millions of Indians, because India had been uh, plagued by famine and by short food shortages for centuries, uh, periodically. Uh, and uh, with the Green Revolution, which introduced new forms of cereals, new techniques, new agricultural methods, um, much of it energy intensive, much of it fertilizer intensive, okay? They needed a lot of chemical fertilizer to keep these new uh, the strains of, uh, of cereals uh, going. But with the Green Revolution, it, uh, India became capable of supporting a much larger population, producing food for a much larger population. But this also means that uh, uh, if this um, current agricultural or agribusiness uh, system in India should fail, uh, the result would be catastrophic because you've reached a threshold of population and of uh, production at a very high intensity, okay, with very high use of fertilizer and energy in many parts of India um, on which one now depends. In other words, loss of flexibility in some ways. And there's also loss of flexibility in terms of, and now I'm gradually talking, beginning to talk about the, the, the topic of today. Um, there's also loss of flexibility in terms of biodiversity because there's only a limited number okay, of, uh, of uh, different uh, strains of wheat and rice, which are the main, uh, the main uh, food crops in, um, in, in most of India. And there's no return. So that's one side effect of um, growth in energy use, um, which was never taken on by, by Leslie White and which is becoming more important now. So, so now on to uh, today's topic, um, species, I mean species of plants and animals, why should we in a course on uh, globalization and overheating and on accelerated change. Why should we concern ourselves with that sort of thing? It's not a topic that is typically taught in courses on globalization around the world. Uh, well, there are many reasons for it, because um, the mobility of species, which is uh, part of uh, human and of the world, the biological history, and has been forever, the mobility of species has been around forever, but there's been an acceleration, right? Acceleration since colonialism and certainly during the present era of intensified, um, uh, intensified uh, mobility, uh, there has been a, a very, very, very clear acceleration in the mobility of species, which has revealed a number of um, vulnerabilities in the ecosystems affected by these species that move. But of course species have always moved. I mean, species migrations, very common. I mean, uh, the kind of stuff studied by paleontologists um, and, um, uh, and by prehistorians, uh, species extinctions have also occurred forever. I mean, since the beginning of life, species extinctions have occurred. Uh, the most famous one being the great extinction of the, big di of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. Okay around 65 million years ago, extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and the humanly um, induced species extinction is also part of human history. 
I mean, it has often been described how the first migrants to America, to North America, how they somehow ate their way down the continent and led to the extinction of quite a large number of uh, docile, big, tasty animals uh, which didn't necessarily have much by way of natural enemies. So they, they weren't prepared to... Um, but they weren't prepared for the uh, onslaught of uh, humans armed with bows, arrows, spears, and so on. Um, in my uh, own uh, anthropological life, uh, my first fieldwork was on the island of Mauritius, you know, which is... Uh, I think I've spoken to you briefly about Mauritius before. Which is out here, right? You have uh, Reunion Island, La Réunion, which is a French département. Here's the Tropic of Capricorn. No, it's not there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the Tropic of Capricorn is just south of Mauritius. So it's just inside the tropics. Which means that in the Mauritian highlands, they have something they call a winter. Affluent people have a fireplace. Charities give out blankets to poor people. So they have something they call a winter in July, August. It doesn't get as cold as this, but it gets chillier than normal. And, um, and the wealthy Mauritians also have a house by the seaside. You see, the, uh, there's a lot of microclimate on small oceanic islands. So, uh, so they go to the seaside uh, during the winter months in order not to get cold, uh, which is about half an hour drive away. Um, and Mauritius is known for a number of things. And probably uh, the most uh, sort of famous event of uh, Mauritius, and certainly for people interested in ecology and biodiversity and animals and, and that sort of thing, is the extinction of the dodo. I mean, there's an expression in English called dead as a dodo. Right? Dead as a dodo. The dodo, which was a flightless bird, it was a sort of a, quite a, sort of a fat, ugly bird, okay? With a large beak. Um, uh, which, uh, which was endemic to Mauritius. In other words, that's the only place where it lived. It, it, it had evolved. This is an oceanic island, far away from the African coast. Uh, so there were several unique species to the island when human being, beings first arrived and settled in the late 17th century. And the dodo was very widespread. I mean, it was very common. The way sort of I imagine it is that they came ashore and they saw these dodos all over the place, milling around. They were slow, they couldn't fly, they had no enemies, there were no poisonous snakes, I mean, there were no uh, larger um, carnivorous animals on the island, so they were totally defenseless, and you could just club them down. I mean, you could use anything, uh, a bottle, you know, <laughs> uh, a hammer, anything you had, a stone, and you just clubbed them in the head, and you roasted them and ate them. So, uh, so the, um, the dodo was already extinct when the French arrived. In, in the uh, um, in around 1715 and had been eradicated by first the Portuguese and then the Dutch who tried to unsuccessfully to colonize Mauritius in the 1600s in the 17th century so the dodo was driven to extinction by, by humans and one could go on there are lots of stories uh, back in history about animals having been driven to extinction by by humans this happened in Australia as well with the Aborigines and elsewhere. But that's not really what we're talking about here. Oh, well, we could, you could talk about the sort of prehistorical spread of species um, on natural rafts, uh, through migrations as a result of climate change, that sort of thing. But the point is that extinctions of animals and plants in the past and their migrations often took place in a rather slow way. Almost like the great human migrations out of Africa 60,000 years ago when they moved possibly... Well, this is being contested because new archaeological uh, findings are being, being, being done all the time. But they moved maybe at the speed of a couple of kilometers a year. You know? two, maybe two kilometers every year they moved. Very, very slowly. <coughs> and species extinction similarly. So we have to keep this in mind when we think about the present and the past. That there are many pasts. Of course, there are many presents as well. And those presents are largely the stuff of anthropology. Uh, but there are many pasts. And one past is the kind of past that you measure on the second hand of your watch. And that's the past of the social sciences, including anthropology. We don't have a very long memory. And then you have the, uh, the past of the minute hand of the clock, of the watch, um, which could be the hand of, uh, of prehistorians, or even some historians, uh, and possibly archaeologists who search for human remains. But then you have the past of geology, and of paleontology, 
and of the, the evolution of species from the amoeba, you know, onwards, from the first single-celled organisms onwards. And then all of a sudden, you operate on a totally different time scale. And we should keep this in mind when we hear about, for example, species extinction, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, I, I once heard a joke uh, about this. Let me just give you the joke before I move on. We've got lots of time. Um, you see, uh, the, ma the major theory about the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago is that there was a huge meteor, okay, a meteoric, um, um, a meteoric uh, landing on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And uh, researchers seem to have found the site of that enormous meteor, which uh, uh, whipped up, I mean, it created fires and it whipped up a lot of uh, smoke and it led to a cooling of the Earth's climate which lasted for a sufficient period for most dinosaurs to, um, to go extinct. But it lasted for a while. And the joke is this. Well, I hear that it was, uh, it was a sort of a, this, this crashing meteor which uh, arrived on the Yucatan Island that killed off all the dinosaurs. But it's a huge coincidence that they were all standing in the same place. <laughs> you know? So that's, that's the idea that things happened suddenly. Things didn't happen suddenly. The wheel was not invited. Uh, from one day to the next. Writing was not invented from one day to the next. And uh, the dinosaur extinction did not take place in one day. It, it, it took a long time before they, uh, uh, they disappeared. So, so just, just, let's just keep this in mind. And what is happening today is that, is that we see changes on the planetary scale uh, in biodiversity uh, and in the human-animal relations and in ecosystems, which we can actually observe almost from one year to the next. And that's something new. It's happened at uh, some of these uh, species extinctions that I'm going to talk about today are happening at, uh, at an unprecedented rate. They're happening so fast it's unimaginable. They're happening at the speed of the second hand, not at the speed of the, of the, of the small uh, hour hand uh, that is the stuff of uh, usual species migration and, uh, and change. So it's not as if this hasn't happened before, it just happened much more slowly and in different ways. Now, uh, let's just zoom forward from the amoeba and the dinosaurs to human, uh, recent human history. Of course, humans have, uh, throughout their history, well, maybe not throughout their history, but, well, I guess throughout their history, yeah, they brought fleas with them. They brought little, sort of little ticks and seeds, you know, when, through their migrations. They brought seeds in their clothing, in their excrement, etc., that have led to the spread of plants and small animals. And more recently, after the domestication of, uh, of animals, they started to bring animals with them, right? I don't know if you're aware of this. I, it was a shock to me when I discovered that um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, they could never have a, a, a eggs for breakfast, okay? They couldn't have boiled eggs or fried eggs, at least not chicken's eggs, because the chicken was brought to Greece uh, later, okay? It was brought by Alexander the Great uh, after his uh, journey to India. So the chicken came from uh, the hen, the chicken, okay, came from India. Uh, so it, it, it arrived in Europe fairly late. So he could never have his breakfast egg unless he ate the eggs of other birds, um, Plato. Uh, so, uh, uh, and in Melanesia, uh, we associate Melanesian and Polynesian societies with pigs, right? Uh, but, uh, of course, the pigs were not endemic. Pigs are interesting, by the way, if you think about uh, invasive species in, in many parts of the world. Uh, pigs that have gone feral, that have gone wild. So pigs were, of course, brought by humans. And there were times, there were situations in Melanesia and in Polynesia where the pigs somehow destroyed more crops and they created more problems for human beings than they created, as it were, utility through being edible animals, especially pigs which, uh, which ran wild. So there are, uh, there are islands in Polynesia where, where pigs have been deliberately ex extinguished, by, brought to extinction by humans because the, uh, the cost-benefit um, balance was negative uh, for, for the pigs. And there's a very famous anthropological book that some of you may have come across, or maybe you will, uh, from the 1960s, called Pigs for the Ancestors. It's a great title. In fact, there was a student band um, back, in, I think, in the li late 1980s called Big Pigs for the Ancestors. We've played a couple of gigs at student parties, and Pigs for the Ancestors by Roy, Rapp Roy Rappaport is about pig cycles, about how the Tsimbaga Maring, uh, the uh, New Guinean people among whom he worked, how they, they, they kept pigs, and they were fond of the pigs, like Melanesians. You know, the most, I mean, in Melanesian culture, the pig is very central. Uh, I mean, people really, they really like the pigs. 
They like to be around them and they like to eat them. Uh, but the pig population grew and grew and grew, which meant that uh, at a certain point, the, the pigs destroyed more crops because, you know, pigs, they nose around, they eat everything, and they can be hard to keep uh, uh, disciplined if there are too many of them. Uh, keep in enclosures and so on. So uh, with cyclical regular intervals, the Tsimbaga Maring, uh, they killed off all the pigs. Okay, so they had these enormous uh, kaiko feasts, as they were called, where, they, where, they, where all the pigs, were, pigs were, were killed. They would then have to move to another homestead, build up a new village, start to grow sweet potatoes, taro and bananas again, and, uh, and uh, begin to build up a new pig population. So in other words, uh, yeah, uh, the point I'm trying to make here, I'm trying to sort of make the point that invasive species, species that have been introduced deliberately or accidentally by humans and have somehow come out of control of humans, it's nothing new. It's not as if we discovered it last year, but it's happened much, much faster. One interesting thing here is that in colonial times, <coughs> species were very often, plants and animals were very often introduced around the world deliberately in order to boost the economy. And again, since I'm talking about Mauritius, since I mentioned Mauritius, the oldest tropical botanical garden in the world is in Mauritius. Okay? Um, because uh, being an oceanic island, the biodiversity in the island was limited. And the, and the colonizers, the French in the 18th century, in the 1700s, um, were, were keen to, um, to use Mauritius to produce, well, tropical fruits and sugar and uh, various other things. So everything was brought there from elsewhere. The sugar cane came from Java. And they also brought the, the Javanese deer to have something to hunt. You know, so they, they introduced the deer. Uh, and they also introduced a, a great variety of palms and fruit trees and uh, various other plants. And they were all planted at first experimentally. This was around, you know, 1730s, quite a long time ago. They were first planted. Are you looking at it now? At the Jardin de Pamplemousse? No. It just shut down. All right, sorry about that, yeah. Um, Jardin de Pamplemousse, which means the, um, the pineapple, the pineapple gardens. Okay, so the pineapple was one of the first plants that they tried to introduce. So they tried experimentally to introduce a variety of fruits and other plants to see which would thrive and which would not, and which could be exploited experimentally, no, um, economically. And, uh, and so they tried several varieties of frugicane, cane, for example, and the point is that in the 18th century, people were really happy about this. Col the colonizers were really happy about the possibility of bringing plants around the world to see where they would thrive or not. I mean, think about Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia, uh, before industrialization, the, the, the main export product of Malaysia was rubber, right? Rubber plantations. The, the only reason why 10% uh, of the Malaysian uh, population are of Indian origin is the rubber plantations. They were brought from India as indentured laborers to work on the rubber plantations. But of course, the rubber is a, is a South American tree. And it was initially brought to the botanical gardens in Singapore. That's how the rubber uh, tree came to, to Southeast Asia. And when, we, when you think about... What kind of plants do people grow uh, to get an outcome from them around the world? Many of them have been introduced, and many of them fairly recent in colonial times, such as uh, cocoa in West Africa, one of the largest cocoa producers in the world. I mean, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Ghana, and so on. But the cocoa, as you would know, is, um, is Central American um, coffee. The other way, right? The other direction. Okay, coffee, which is uh, Ethiopian. Um, but the largest coffee producers in the world are Brazil and Colombia, and so on and so forth. So the point is that during colonialism, um, there was great excitement around the idea that you could transplant plants and animals uh, f from around the world to the colonies. And there was a great concern in Britain, in some of the British colonies, to Anglify to turn uh, their colonies into something resembling England. And one way of doing this was by introducing English plants and animals. So um, you realize now maybe that I'm, I'm slowly beginning to... Oh, time is going, but uh, no, never mind. Uh, you realize that I'm slowly beginning to talk about the rabbit and the fox in Australia. Okay? <laughs> but that's, that's, sort of, that's, the, um, that's the subtext okay, of what I'm saying. But the trout, I mean, in, in, in northern India, uh, you can... Uh, Till this day, you can go trout fishing in Himachal Pradesh, in northern India, uh, because the trout was introduced there by, uh, by, by the English in order to uh, somehow 
uh, try to emulate Englishness. So the idea was that not only people who moved should come from, from uh, in settler colonies, should come from, uh, from, the, from the homeland, but they would also try to transform the land to make it resemble uh, the original country uh, more and more. Um, so, um, yeah. But uh, the tides have shifted. So in the last few decades, there has been a growing concern, just in the last few decades, not much longer than that, there has been a growing concern and a mounting concern among locals and environmentalists and others in many communities. And uh, Marianne Lien and um, Aidan Davidson's article is about this, with an example from Tasmania, with authenticity. I once remember, I mean, I remember, I mean, years ago I visited uh, an ecological, sort of sustainable, um, uh, game lodge in uh, East Africa, in Kenya. Ecological, sustainable, everything was right. I mean, they got all their electricity from uh, solar panels, okay? They were not connected to the grid. There was no oil, you know, no oil economy, no diesel generator. All the water was purified water from the, from the river nearby, etc. And they were also greatly concerned that all the plants, you know, all the flowery bushes and things that they, they should have on the, that they had on the property to make it look nice for the visiting tourists should be endemic. They should be local. They should come from there. And not just from Africa, not just from East Africa, not just from Kenya, but from this part of Kenya. They should be endemic. So there is this concern, uh, which somehow, and that's an interesting thing, and I'm going to return to that after the break, which somehow is reflected in some of the current concerns with identity politics and boundaries. I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but the same figure of thought. I remember talking to um, people in Australia about Australian flora and fauna. Australia is one of the parts of the world which is most strongly affected by species invasion. I mean, you might say there was, there was a limited uh, number of species to begin with, and they had not evolved along the same lines as European species, more vulnerable to, uh, uh, <laughs> to invasion. And I remember talking to people there who might say th thing, things such as anything that wasn't here at the time of the arrival of Captain Cook shouldn't be here. And that was sort of the time limit. And then you look at them, and they, they would be, you know, white people, okay? Not Aborigines. I say, well, you know, you, your ancestors, I mean, uh, well, yeah, but, you know, human beings. Uh, and then you start to press them a bit, because before Captain Cook, it seems as if anything before Captain Cook was authentic, which means that Aborigines were authentic. White people somehow are not, but still, I mean, we're white people, and we can't help it. Um, but what about the dingo? Uh, is the dingo an invasive species? Okay? The dingo, which is a kind of, uh, it's a wild dog. I mean, uh, the jury is a bit out on when it arrived and where it came from. I think it was probably, that's my th sort of view anyway, um, it was probably b brought uh, by, uh, by uh, Malaysian uh, seafarers uh, maybe s between six and 8,000 years ago. So it's quite a long time ago. The dingo has been there for a long time because it resembles domesticated or semi-domesticated dogs from Southeast Asia. But there are other theories. But the point is that the dingo is not native to Australia in the sense that it evolved there. It, uh, it was brought there by human beings and possibly um, just six to 8,000 years ago. But still, a long time before Captain Cook, which was just a little more than 200 years ago. But still, I mean, the dingo. Yeah, which has, which has driven other species to extinction. For example, the Tasmanian wolf. I mean, not in Tasmania, because Tasmania is the only part of Australia which doesn't have dingoes. You know, Tasmania, big island just south of, of the continent. Uh, so there you have uh, Tasmanian wolves, still a few left. But on the uh, mainland, on mainland Australia, the, the, the Tasmanian wolf was probably driven to extinction by dingoes. So it was an invasive species. But somehow, again, it depends on what part of the what you're looking at. Are you looking at the second hand or maybe the minute hand when you, when you draw the line as to when... Uh, uh, as it were, history began, when recent history began. So the tides have changed, and uh, one of the, uh, as I said, one of the changes has been attempts to restore ecosystems in places like Australia, but also in North America, to restore them to their original state. I almost said to the, to the state of nature, right? And that, I'm coming to that as well. There's something interesting happening here in the interface between, you might say, culture and nature uh, when we deal with the invasive species. Because what are they? They were brought there by human beings, very often for a reason. Uh, and uh, and uh, now one sees them as being artificial. And um, I mean, um, 
You know, when Marianne Lien once told me, I mean, when she did, fi did field work in, Austra in Australia and Tasmania, um, must have been 15 years ago by now, um, she was sort of part of these uh, volunteer groups uh, which went out on Sundays in high visibility clothing with gloves, you know, and with big bags and with gardening tools trying to eradicate uh, these South African uh, shrubs uh, which were growing wild up on the hills in, uh, and in gullies in Tasmania. These South African shrubs were brought there just a few decades earlier by people who wanted them in the gardens because the climates are comparable, right? The climate in Australia and in South Africa uh, are often, uh, often compatible and, uh, and they wanted something nice in the garden. So they brought these lovely uh, South African uh, shrubs, you know, flowery shrubs, which were nice in the 1960s and 70s. And all of a sudden, at a certain point, maybe in the 1990s, maybe a little bit earlier, they ceased to be nice. They became artificial invaders and they didn't belong and they were much out of place and should be uh, literally weeded out. <laughs> so th th isn't this interesting? I mean, how the mentality changes in relation to some of these, uh, uh, some of these issues. And that, of course, is also the, uh, the topic of, uh, of um, Marianne Lienz and uh, Davison's art article about this, uh, these contested trees, uh, which they also have interesting things to say about. And I'm going to say some of these things afterwards. But first, why is it then that some introduced species are considered just introduced? I mean, like the pig in Norway. We don't think about that as an invasive species. The pig in Australia is considered non-invasive and invasive. If it is in an enclosure, if it's on the farm, it's okay. Because then it's used for, to produce bacon, you know, and steaks. But when it goes wild and becomes feral, a feral pig, uh, it becomes a pest. And in fact, the, uh, the, wild, the, the wild pigs, feral pigs, may be the greatest threat to many endangered species in Australia. I mean, they eat eggs, you know, they eat little um, reptiles. I mean, pigs eat everything. Uh, and they dig up roots and so on. And there are hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, and uh, there's no way one will ever be able to get rid of them in Australia. So uh, the definition here is, and I now take the definition from the US government, okay, of an invasive species. An invasive species is an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. In other words, invasive species are largely defined from an anthropocentric perspective. You know, it's the, if it causes harm to human beings, if it causes harm to our economy or whatever, um, it's no good. Now, there are environmentalists who see it differently, who see invasive species whether they cause harm to humans or not, as being destructive because they upset uh, the um, diversity and the balance of the existing ecosystem and they drive other species to extinction. And I've got many stories about those and I think I'll tell you some of them. But I think the, the attention that we now should give to invasive species and species invasion, it highlights the relevance of this term that I've <coughs> That has become fashionable, but it has become fashionable for a reason. And I've mentioned it to you several times before during this course, the term of the Anthropocene, right? <laughs> that particular period in the history of the planet when one species somehow completely transforms uh, the planet, the Anthropocene. Still hasn't been officially decided that it is a geological era, but... Um, it, we might be getting there. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, maybe the Anthropocene started around the time of mass um, exploitation of fossil fuels, because then things really started to take off, and human domination on the planet became complete. And in many cases, and that's one of the topics uh, that I'm interested in regarding invasive species, nature was no longer a threat, but it was vulnerable and endangered and needed our protection. I mean, think about this. Nature, uh, put bluntly, nature has always been a threat to culture. Maybe not so much among hunters and gatherers. We have, we have anthropological literature about this as well. Maybe not so much among hunters and gatherers because uh, to them, uh, they were a seamless part of their environment to a greater extent than farmers. But the moment farming started, nature in the form of, I mean in Africa, elephants, baboons, insects, pests, whatever, rabbits, rats, 
uh, it, it needed. You needed to protect yourself against it. You needed to build fences against nature. And you tried, you tried to control the forces of nature because nature was stronger than you. Right? Because there were just a few of us, human beings, with limited technology and limited skills. And nature sort of destroyed our lives and threatened to uh, create chaos where we had, you know, um, painstakingly developed order. And all of a sudden, during the course of the de development of the Anthropocene, nature is, at least in many parts of the world, no longer perceived as a threat, but as being threatened by us. So nature has been a cultural proje uh, project. Protecting nature has become a cultural project, rather than being a danger against culture. And this is something which is, uh, I say, it's, um, it's something very new. And it's something very, uh, it's a poignant thing. There is a very difficult but very rewarding book by Marilyn Suthern, which somehow takes up some of these issues, <coughs> which I'd just like to mention to you. It doesn't, she doesn't talk about species in nation. She talks about uh, assisted reproduction, about, uh, you know, um, uh, test tube babies, that sort of thing, surrogate mothers, that kind of thing. And the book is called After Nature. And she somehow, so if any of you have the time after the exam and want to read more about the collapse somehow of the boundary between nature and culture, um, give it a try. Strathern, After Nature, 1992. Um, okay. So, uh, but, but it's not about the Anthropocene, it's not about species invasion, but it's somehow about the same things that we're talking about, how the boundary between nature and culture has been challenged and how culture uh, has become the guardian of nature rather than its enemy, rather than its opposite. And what they're saying is somehow, not, don't quote me on this, but what this implies is somehow that there is more culture than nature. There is so little nature left. I mean, you've heard, you've heard that as well. There's so little nature left. Because there is this idea that there is something which is culture, which is human, and there's something which is nature, which is not. And what about these species? What about wild pigs in Australia? Are they nature or are they culture? Well, they're neither nor. They matter out of place. They don't fit in. Because they were brought by humans to serve an economic purpose. They, they then became wild, and they are somehow, they don't really belong there. And people don't see them as Australian animals, but they're all over the place, and they're wild, and they can be quite dangerous to meet, you know. Some of these pigs are very big and, uh, and quite aggressive. Okay, so you, you watch out for the pigs when you go to, to, into the bush. Not just poisonous snakes, but pigs as well. <coughs> so, um, and, okay, uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, studies of species in nation and of uh, the spread of various species of plants and uh, animals and their unintentional side effects, not only does it tell us something about <coughs> biogeography, you know, the geography of biological distribution. Not only does it tell us something about globalization, but it also tells us a lot about human responses to globalization, human responses to accelerated change, which is out of our control. So in some ways, in Australia, uh, there's a clear tendency, and we might return to that towards the end of, 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 of the lecture, there is a clear tendency that people talk about invasive species very much in the same way as they talk about migrants. Because, as, as, as some of you may know, Australia has very strict migration controls these days, becoming stricter. Um, and they send out rather negative, rather hostile messages to boat refugees. You know, desperate people are trying to get a foothold in this vast, almost empty continent. And they send out rather hostile messages. Go home, we're not going to let you in, you know, that sort of thing. Um, establishing asylum centres outside of Australia, on islands nearby, New Guinea, Manus Island, off New Guinea, uh, Christmas Island, and so on, uh, in order to um, even prevent them from, from setting foot on Australian soil. And when some Australians talk about the cane toad, or about the rabbit, or about the fox, or about other invasive species, they use the same terminology. I'm not saying that it's the same thing. It's not necessarily the same people who worry about cane toads uh, as the, the, the people who worry about Muslims. But they talk in the same manner. And it's a very sort of Mary Douglas way of talking about boundaries and purity and danger and matter out of place. So in other words, read anthropology and you'll understand why Australians talk in a particular way about the cane toad and the same way about, uh, about Muslims. Um, I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but just that it's the same figure of thought. 
the same <coughs> notion <coughs> about being invaded from the outside and of there having been a pre-existing purity, which is authentic and which is good. So um, it would be pure speculation to argue that the uh, opinion against in, uh, introduced species in Australia developed around the same time as large-scale migration from non-European countries started. But it, they did coincide in time, okay? Large-scale migration from non-European uh, societies started in the late 1970s. Concern about uh, um, some of these species of plants, for example, started maybe a little bit later, around the same time. Anyway, let's move on. Why, how, how are species moved around the world? Just to take a few descriptive things. One main way in which species are being introduced, many of these species are marine, right? I mean, uh, um, uh, along the Norwegian coast, there is a lot of talk about the, the king crab, the Russian crab, the Kamchatka crab, okay? Have this coastline. And then you have Russia just, I mean, just across here, okay? And as we say in Norwegian, we can you see the grensoner fun. You cannot see the border without, uh, below the sea. So uh, there's no border control for the Kamchatka crab, so it could move freely, and it's now moving down the coast. And it's very controversial because it's, a, it's considered a delicacy. It has very white, very nutritious and tasty flesh, but it drives away all the other crabs and, uh, and uh, uh, various other animals. And the um, Kamchatka crab was in turn introduced around here, you know, in, uh, off, off the Kola Peninsula in northwestern Russia. Uh, during the Soviet period. So it came from Siberia, from, from the east. And now it's gradually making its way down the coast. And there's an ambivalent, that's, that's an interesting thing, there's an ambivalent discourse about the Kentropical crab. I mean, if you go into supermarkets in Oslo, you'll find them. You know, you, you, can, you can get them at restaurants, and they're, as I said, considered good. But still, they don't belong. And they drive out the natives. So there must be something wrong with them. They shouldn't be here. They disrupt the balance of the ecosystem. But as I was starting to say, one main way in which species are being moved around the world, not deliberately, but accidentally, okay, there's a main difference here, right, between the deliberate introduction of species and the accidental, uh, is through ballast. Yeah. As, you, as you would know, I mean, uh, empty ships, in order not to capsize, in order to somehow keep the momentum in the water, they need ballast if they don't have cargo. Um, and typically, um, Ships, I mean, they, they have I mean, hundreds of thousands of litres of ballast, which, are being which is being released in coastal waters. So the ballast water comes from one place, and it's being released somewhere else. The ballast water typically, I mean, in, in sort of the part of the world where I work, the ballast water comes from Australia, and it's being released outside of China, right? Because Australia's exports to China are far less than their imports from China, right? And the, sort of, they get ballast water full of various organisms and fish and bacteria and shit, you know, from Australian seas, and they return full of electronics and clothes. That's a, the, sort of the short story. But the point is that um, so many species, and not just fish, and not just algae, and not just seaweed, but also bacteria, viruses, uh, are being spread around the world in this way. Uh, creating, uh, creating uh, significant uh, vulnerability. Jellyfish and viruses such as cholera. I mean, I, I read a story somewhere about uh, a country uh, in, in, uh, in Asia. I, I can't remember which country it was. Maybe one of you remember the story where tens of thousands of people died of cholera as a result of the cholera virus having been brought in ballast with a, with a ship from somewhere else. So that's, an in, that's a sort of an almost invisible way of, of being um, um, species being moved around the world. And you can see how efficient it is, considering the amount of trade by cargo ships uh, these days, <laughs> which is enormous, which could have been the topic of a lecture. Maybe next year, if we, get, if we have the possibility to have a 12th lecture, we'll talk about the container ship, the shipping container, okay, as a symbol of globalization. Uh, but we, we didn't get to 12th lecture this year, so, um, but now I've mentioned it. And another way is, uh, as I said, deliberate, economic. Deliberate economic introduction of species, such as the pig uh, around the world, the chicken in south southern Europe, etc. But also leisure. Because why are there foxes in Australia? Why should the British be so foolish as to bring foxes to Australia? Well, because they wanted, as I said, to recreate the Little England. Remember, they call this 
main, the main colony was called New South Wales. They wanted it to be just like South Wales. And since increasingly there were upper class people who came to Australia. And you know what upper class people in England still do. I mean, uh, when they have time to spare. <laughs> um, they don't go to the pub and watch football. They, they go uh, fox hunting, okay? Fox hunting with horses and dogs. So they had to have some foxes in order to be able to hunt foxes just like they had in England. So the foxes were brought um, uh, almost around the same, well a bit later, a few decades later than the rabbit. The rabbits were brought to Australia already with the first fleet in 1788, the first rabbits. And they were kept in cages for food. Makes sense, doesn't it? There weren't that many small animals that were edible in Australia. So they were kept in cages for food. But of course, knowing rabbits, they soon escaped. Or some soon escaped. And also knowing rabbits, they reproduced really fast. You know, they bred like rabbits. Okay? So uh, after only a few decades, and this is when, you know, the anthrop Anthropocene started around this time, okay? So this is when things started to speed up in the world. So as early as the 1830s, just 50 years after the first rabbit had set its paws on Australian soil, um, uh, they were starting to compl there were complaints about how, how rabbits destroyed, you know, things and how, how they sort of destroyed crops and uh, there were too many rabbits and maybe we should, maybe the, uh, already in the 1830s, people in Australia were saying that maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all to bring rabbits here because they don't really belong in Australia, and they, they mess up things. Uh, so that's the second. And I have some more things to say about, um, uh, some more things to say about um, um, rabbits afterwards, um, but there, is, uh, there are just a couple of other um, things. Leisure, they were brought there for leisure activities. Uh, escaped pets. Did you know that the, maj the main threat to the existing ecosystem in the Everglades in southern Florida is the Burmese python, okay? The Burmese python, which is a, a, a frightening snake, a very large snake. And it's not, it's not just a threat to amphibians, to birds, to little mammals, but even to the alligator, you know, the, the very symbol of, the, of southern Florida. Uh, because uh, because py the, the python eats alligator eggs and, uh, and the alligator young. And uh, they were brought, uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're basically escaped pets. People uh, got, got a tropical pet because you can buy tropical pets in, in the Florida legally. So they had a snake. I mean, and then the snake, maybe it grew too big or you got tired of it or, or it just sort of uh, snaked its way out of your house and ended up in a nearby stream where conditions were perfect for the Burmese python on top of the food chain. So escaped pets, quite common. And also many species of fish in, uh, in, in various parts of the state uh, started in, in this way. And then <laughs> stowaways, what I call stowaways, blind passagerer, okay? Stowaways on uh, ships. Now, why are there rats everywhere in the world? I mean, there are, uh, it is said, I mean, the only place in the world where, where there aren't any rats is Antarctica. <coughs> I'm sure there are oceanic islands without rats. Well, because rats and boats, rats and ships, they go together. Rats love human beings, so they like to be around us. And uh, if we have a ship, they get on board the ship, and when we get off the ship, they get off the ship, and they, again, they start to breed like rats. So, uh, so the rats, stowaways, rats, rodents, other insects, many seeds, and so on. And then um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that also after the break, uh, simply other forms of transportation, terrestrial transportation, and it could be tourism. Why do we have the Iberian slug in Norway? Brun snailen, okay, the Iberian slug, um, which is economically useless. Nobody eats it. The, it doesn't have any natural predators. My cat doesn't want to touch them. I mean, we have them all over my garden sometimes. Um, and how, how, did they ca how did they come? Well, there are two takes on this. They were brought back from Spain or France by tourists who somehow had some, you know, snail eggs or whatever in their, in their luggage uh, or through soil and flowers which were imported. So whenever there is trade, as I said, whenever you do something, uh, it has uh, unintentional consequences. So you, you, you think that you're just importing plants and, and, uh, and soil from Spain or France. And what you do is, in fact, you also import an entire little sort of micro ecosystem of uh, various uh, organisms. <laughs> so simply transportation. Transportation. Terrestrial transportation. 
a lot of uh, mobility of species takes place uh, that way. One of the big scandals uh, where I did fieldwork in Australia um, that the newspaper wrote about no end was the discovery of a small colony of South American fire ants uh, on, the, on the mainland. Uh, there are fire ants in various locations in Queensland. Um, and there are great sort of great efforts are being made to eradicate them, to get rid of them. I mean, the fire ants, they don't, it's not so much that they um, destroy crops because they're not interested in vegetables, they're not interested in carrots and, and uh, sugar cane, uh, but they're very unpleasant to be around. The bite is, is very venomous, okay, you get swellings, you know, it, it hurts very much, and they also outcompete some of the native ants. So there was a big outrage and there was a big debate, which is st still till this day, I checked it last night in the Gladstone Observer on, the, on my local paper in Australia. Um, it's still unresolved how they got there. But surely they got there through transportation from, uh, with, uh, I mean, um, with other things, accidentally. So those are some of the main ways in which um, these um, animals and plants are being transported around the world. And this is taking place at a, at a faster and faster speed. Uh, we had a story. Uh, at the departmental seminar a couple of years ago when James Wiener was here, who's an anthropologist who works both in Australia and in New Guinea, and he told a story about one of the un unintentional side effects of a mining project in New Guinea, which was that all of a sudden the taro, you know, the, uh, the tuba, the main staple food for the local people, all of a sudden uh, the taro caught some kind of mystical disease, uh, and, uh, which, which reduced the yields dramatically. Uh, and uh, didn't have that disease before, it was unknown, but it was known in other places. So it, it came, that disease came. As I said, just like viruses can be brought by, through ballast. The, the virus, uh, sorry, the, the taro disease was uh, somehow brought through the increased traffic. So if they hadn't built the road, the taro would still have been fine. But if they hadn't built the road, they also wouldn't have had a shop or a mine. So there's no simple solution. But uh, invasive species as a side effect of other things. So let's take a break and uh, then we'll continue. We don't take the long historical view back to the extinction of the dinosaurs and, and artificial rafts, you know, natural rafts that brought animals and plants to various uh, uh, islands, uh, not least in the tropics. But if we take this uh, slightly shorter, I mean, if we concentrate on the, uh, on, the, on the second hand, just the last few hundred years, I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that <laughs> until the recent shift in attitudes towards introduced species, where all of a sudden they were seen as a threat and as a danger, um, uh, there was a great deal of social engineering involved in introducing species. The idea was that uh, we human beings, and especially the masters of the universe, who were the colonizing uh, countries uh, for, for a while, uh, who saw themselves as the masters of the universe, were entitled to, and indeed were obliged to, shaping uh, the colonies and the areas that they dominated in order to suit their needs. So that uh, a, a great deal of uh, um, what would later be seen as invasive species were brought for, for this particular reason. And let me just give you one more example from Mauritius, because Mauritius is an interesting case when we look at species and species in nation, because it was an isolated oceanic island, right, with very, very little, I mean, compared to, certainly compared to Africa and, and Madagascar, very little diversity. There was a malaria epidemic in the 1860s, and that was when people moved, started to move from the coast up to the highlands, that I mentioned the highlands, for just 400 meters above sea level, uh, where they have fireplaces, the affluent have fireplaces, and the poor get blankets from charities. Uh, that, that's when they started to move up there to kill Pip, which is still sort of the poshest area in Mauritius where you can live, uh, because of the malaria epidemic uh, by, the, by the coast, in Paul Rui, the, the capital. And in a bid to try to stop this malaria epidemic, because everybody knew that it was caused by mosquitoes, uh, they started to, to plant uh, eucalypts, you know, eucalyptus trees, gum trees from Australia on a large scale because they use so much water uh, in a bid to dry out some of the marshlands where the mosquitoes bred. You see, so this sort of conscious shaping of the environment with no concern with origins, authenticity, that sort of thing. It's a very modern sensibility, right? It's a very modern view. Uh, we don't care about the past. We want to control the future, you know, that sort of attitude. Whereas what has happened in the last few years, and in tandem with an increased emphasis in many parts of the world with identity politics, 
authenticity. What is it to be a good Sami? You know, we should revive our language. We shouldn't become like everybody else. We shouldn't forget who we are and where we're coming from, etc. Uh, at the same time as this has taken place around the world, an intensified identity politics and the sense of loss uh, associated with cultural change, rather than a sense of gain, which was more common um, some decades earlier. Uh, the uh, um, introduced species have increasingly also be, been seen as a threat. And I mean, even up here, well, I, I spoke about the Kamchatka crab, but there are certain forms of seaweed which also come with ballast, which are threatening um, along, the, along the, the, the long coastline of Norway, some of the endemic indigenous forms of, of seaweed, uh, creating uh, a great deal of, uh, of concern uh, among locals. And there was even, uh, I mean, often Posten, the main Norwegian newspaper, has been running articles on and off in the last few years about the new species that might enter this country as a result of climate change. You know, talking in a very, very dramatic way about the possibility that we might again get wild boars, you know, wild boars, okay, in, uh, in Norwegian forests, which were here a few thousand years ago, during the mild climate, mild period of the Bronze Age. There were wild boars there, they were hunted. And then they, were, they, they went extinct, or they went south because it was too cold. Uh, and now they may be coming back. So there's a big, uh, the big concern with this. But let's, let's just look at Australia once more to show how um, intentional uh, social engineering has unintentional side effects and with, with environment and species as a nation, as an example. I mentioned a rabbit which somehow has become the symbol for many environmentalists and I guess for many others, a symbol of the uh, insight or the notion that one shouldn't tamper too much with ecosystems because you don't know what, what's going to happen. I mean, uh, there is a reason, as it were. There is an ecological reason why certain animals are there and not there. So, uh, so uh, rabbits now all over Australia, except in the, in the tropical north, um, and uh, in 1907, the problem, the rabbit problem, had become such that uh, uh, an enormous fence was built along Western Australia, uh, the rabbit fence. And there's also a great film um, called Rabbit Fence, which is about Aborigines and which is about the sort of the, uh, you might say, the ways in which Aborig Aboriginal children, and especially the so-called half-caste children, the people who were neither Aboriginal nor white, but a bit of both, how they were being treated by Australian uh, governments until fairly recently, taken away from the families, etc., in order to civilize them. And, uh, and these children, they try to return home by following the rabbit fence, because this rabbit fence, it runs for hundreds of miles along um, um, the... Um, perimeter of agricultural activities in Western Australia in an attempt to keep the rabbits out. And it was built in 1907, started in 1907. A major job to build that fence. And did it work? I mean, uh, I asked my daughter about this uh, last night. Do you think it worked? I said, you know, knowing rabbits, what do you think? Well, she said, I mean, rabbits are rather good at burrowing. You know, they're good at good diggers, okay? And they can jump quite high. And this is exactly what happened. And there were herds in the fence now and then. I mean, hundreds of miles to maintain that. It's a big job. And they had to uh, have gates in order to let livestock, you know, cows and sheep, move in and out. So, of course, a rabbit fence was quite, uh, quite uh, ineffective, but it shows uh, a sort of a, the, the mounting concern with the rabbit, which was not about purity. It was about practicalities. It destroyed um, their economic um, livelihood. And, and the fox, less of a problem, but still a bit of a pest. But one of the main uh, pests, as it were, in Australia is in fact feral cats. I mean, cats which have been kept as pets, just like the Burmese python in the Everglades in, uh, in, uh, um, in Florida, and have been abandoned or have escaped or whatever. And uh, yeah, th so the feral cat, I mean, there are Australians who hate cats. Australian concerned, committed environmentalists, they hate cats. Uh, just as there are Americans who hate cats. I don't know if any of you have read this book by Jonathan Franzen. What's it called, Elizabeth? His latest novel. I don't remember. Jonathan Franzen's latest novel. It, it, it ends with a sort of 50-page diatribe against cats because cats take songbirds. And not just feral cats, or, uh, or domesticated cats. I mean, your little kitty. I mean, your cute little kitty. It goes out like mine does uh, and, and hunts. And uh, usually it takes mice, which is fine because nobody likes mice, because they're a bit like rats, but it also takes uh, tiny birds. So the feral cats, it's also a major, major uh, pest. But that's not what I was going to say. 
I'm just uh, building momentum to talk about the main case before I move on uh, briefly to the two articles that you've been reading, namely that of the cane toad, okay? The Australian cane toad. Well, it's not Australian, that's a problem. Well, it is now, <laughs> but it didn't used to be. And I sometimes wonder, why do people never learn? I mean, they, they've, been, they've been fighting the proliferating rabbit for two centuries uh, now. Uh, and, uh, and the fox has uh, driven native species to extinction or near extinction. Uh, they have, uh, they have uh, feral camels as well in Australia. I don't know if you're aware of this. I mean, that there are a few hundred thousand camels which roam the dry interior of Australia, which is perfect habitat for camels. Dromedary camels, right? With just one hump. Uh, which were initially brought there for transportation in the 19th century with Afghans. You know, they have the Afghan camel herders. A big point made by, by Muslim identity politicians in Australia these days is that, in fact, the history of Islam in Australia goes back to the 1830s. It's not as if it happened in the 1970s that the first Muslims came. And it's true. Afghans came with camels and uh, used them for transportation in arid areas. But then, of course, some of these camels, uh, they were abandoned or they escaped or, or whatever, and they became wild. So there are now thousands and thousands of wild camels and when there is uh, a shortage of water they can be quite aggressive so there are local communities in Australia where, where camels are being perceived as a real threat you know they come in they attack people they're very big animals desperate for water and food right um, so uh, so one would think that sooner or later they would learn not to interfere with local ecosystems but in 1935 there was a problem in the Queensland sugar plantations. You know, Australia, which <laughs> looks like this. This is Tasmania, by the way. Which has, Tasmania, being an island, has been somehow uh, exempt from some of the uh, uh, species invasions that we're talking about, but not from the Monterey pine, as you know. The Monterey pine uh, lives in Tasmania, has been planted in Australia. So, um, and there's the, no, the Tropic of Capricorn around here, and in this area, this area is a big sugar, uh, sugar growing area, especially a bit south actually of, uh, of the Tropic of Capricorn. Big sugar cane growing area. And there was a problem, and also further north, Cairns and so on, um, uh, that um, there was a certain beetle, uh, the cane beetle, okay, an insect which ate and um, which, which ate um, sugar cane. And it was very hard, I mean, to do anything about the. Uh, the cane beetle. I mean, uh, it was resistant to most of, the, uh, most of the chemicals they used and so on. So in 1935, experimentally, they, they brought a few uh, Caribbean cane toads, uh, which were known for their uh, sort of being specialized in eating cane beetles. That was a sort of the favorite. Their preferred food was cane beetles. And uh, it came from the Caribbean, from other sugar islands, small sugar islands in the Caribbean, where they seemed to do a good job. They seemed to make themselves useful. So first, I mean, just four uh, cane toads were brought in 1935, experimentally. They were caged and one tried out, you know, whether they would thrive there, whether they could reproduce and whether they would actually eat those beetles. And so they were eventually released on the sugar plantations in order to keep the uh, beetle population in check. Very bad idea. Uh, because it turns out that the cane toads were not as efficient as one had believed in eating uh, uh, the, uh, the insects, because the insects tend to live a bit up, you know, high, high up on the, on the sugar cane. You know, sugar cane is, can be you know, several meters high, uh, three meters, that sort of thing. And the cane toad didn't climb unless it really had to, it didn't want to climb. And the cane toad also felt a bit vulnerable in the sugar plantations because there were some open spaces making it uh, vulnerable to, uh, to pr predators, uh, to um, to uh, predatory birds and so on. So uh, the, uh, toad, the toad soon left the plantation and went for greener pastures elsewhere, right? And uh, it moves. You might say, I mean, I mentioned the, speed, the typical speed of migration among humans um, <laughs> after the exodus from, or the departure from Africa. Um, those, those who left, those who didn't stay, okay? Many people stayed in Africa, some left. The typical speed of migration and the cane toad moves sort of westwards, I think currently at the speed of one kilometer a year, something like that, one to two kilometers a year. And in periods of flood, much faster because then it's wet and it's easier for, for the toad to, uh, to move. So it, uh, it has so, uh, sort of spread and now it covers sort of most of the, apart from the dry interior, I mean, 
uh, toadstone like desert. So it spreads and it is now, it has now, en is now entering this area of Western Australia, which is a sacred area to many Australians because it's, as I say, one of the few remaining pristine wildernesses, right? Untouched wilderness. It's called the Kimberley. And it has now somehow reached the Kimberley. So the, the toad has slowly moved westwards. There are millions of them. Um, and um, not only do they outcompete other small reptiles. Now, a, a toad, I mean, small toads are about this big, okay, when they're, when they're just uh, hatched. But they can be about this size, you know. Um, there's a nice picture on the overheading, uh, no, overheating, um, on the overheating website uh, where I, I wrote a blog about to toad busting when I was in Australia doing field work. There's a nice picture of a young boy holding up a rather grown spe specimen of, of the cane toad, which is about this big. So they can, be, they can become quite big. Uh, and not only do they outcompete other reptiles and other animals, but they're also poisonous, you see. Um, to most creatures, they're poisonous. So uh, they're also a threat to many of the smaller predators. So there are certain uh, endemic predators in Queensland and also in, in the Northern Territory, which are now in regions close to extinction because they've eaten cane toads and been poisoned, right, and died, okay? So for example, there are rare little animals. I mean, there's one called the Northern Quoll, for example. I'm not going to explain to you what kind of animal it is. If you're interested, you can look it up. The Northern Quoll uh, is in great danger now because they, uh, they look at the toad Nobody has told them that it's not edible. They eat it and they die. Certain birds have learned how to, de how to deal with the cane toad. Uh, because you can turn it over on its back, right? You can turn it over on its back. And if you then sort of eat it from the stomach, just take a part of the stomach, and you leave the back, uh, uh, you know, uh, un uneaten, you'll survive. Uh, because uh, the poison glands are on the back of the, of the toad. This is quite remarkable, but I've actually seen it myself. I mean, I saw sort of a long, uh, uh, there was a small pond, you know, a friend of mine who has a big property in, uh, in central Queensland, and he took me around, and we saw along the perimeter of the pond, there were several de dead um, toads, which had clearly been eaten from the inside, from, from the stomach. Um, so intelligent birds. But most animals don't do it, so they're, they're, they're considered the pest. In order to try to do something about the toad uh, issue, uh, there are teams of volunteers that go out on every Tuesday night uh, called toad, the toad Busters, okay? And they have these adverts which say, you know, who are you going to call Toad Busters, you know, as in, as in, as in Ghost Busters. Um, uh, and when you go out, I've, I've done this several times in various locations around Gladstone where I did fieldwork, uh, and there are quite a few people, young families, pensioners, all sorts of people, all, all ages, who come along and take part in toad busting. And when you've done it, when you've filled your sack with toads, and you know that they are going to be killed in the most humane way by being frozen, okay, in a huge, in a huge freezer, which is probably better than burning them alive. I mean, uh, if you think about it, um, or gassing them, um, you feel that you've done something really useful, and you feel like you made yourself useful for the environment. Um, and uh, uh, this is quite interesting because um, if we look at this in the broader context, Kate, uh, toad busting, it's not going to help. It's, it's, I mean, it's not going to help us get rid of the toads. I mean, when we go out there, for example, you go out in the botanical gardens, uh, which is also full of non-endemic plants, but there are fewer of them now than there used to be. They've got rid of some of the non-endemic plants. But when you go into the botanical garden south of Gladstone in the evening, and you light with your torch, you know, around, and you see this sort of movement everywhere, and you look, and there are toads all over the place, most of them tiny. Tiny hoppers, as I say, in, the, <laughs> in Australia. And, uh, and some of them are grown, grown big, sort of uh, alpha male uh, toads. And they're very slow. So if you, if the moment, as soon as you learn sort of how to approach them, you approach them slowly like this. And then you bend down slowly, you know. No abrupt movement. You can easily pick them up. And you can fill up a sack with toads in, in an hour or two. So you, you feel that you've done something useful for the environment. But, but of course you know that um, it has no effect whatsoever on the number of toads. It has no effect, no measurable effect, but you feel that it's good. And one reason why toad busting is so popular in a place like Gladstone, which is an industrial town, is that it's uncontroversial. People live in an industrial place, which, uh, which is, as I say, I mean, it's marinated in fossil fuels. It's, they have a huge uh, coal power plant. They have one of the largest coal ports in, in the world. And they have uh, uh, two alumina refineries and lots of other industry. And virtually everybody works in the industry or their husband does or, 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 or their brother-in-law or, you know, their, their nephew. Or maybe there are a few women who work in the industry too, but they tend to do other jobs. 
Uh, so uh, you feel a bit bad about this, feel a bit bad about what you're doing to the environment. You know that the industry has some unintentional side effects. So if you can do a bit of toad busting, the industry is not going to complain because it doesn't affect them. You know? uh, and you can feel that you've, uh, you've, done, something, um, you can, you've done something useful. So that's the, that's the, that's the cane toad. One, just one final example that I'm not going to talk about now because we, we don't have the time, but I, I say a few words about it. Um, it's also an interesting case, again, um, of a deliberate introduction of a species. And this species was introduced in order to, well, partly for recreational fishing, but also in order to control algae, okay? Because it's, uh, it's a vegetarian fish. Um, so just do a, if you're interested in this sort of thing, do a Google search on silver carp, okay? Silver carp and um, click on the first YouTube link you find. Um, and you'll see a scene from a river somewhere in the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, um, one of the tributary rivers to the Mississippi. Um, and you'll see a river with, uh, with, with a few boats and people who are sort of out in their boats. And around them, there is this, as it's, it's as if the river is boiling. Because the silver carp uh, is a fish which is not only um, very proficient, I mean, in reproducing itself, but it's also, it also jumps. You know, it jumps. So there are people who actually get injured. I mean, as I say, there are public warnings now uh, in, along these rivers with signposts which say, don't water ski here. I mean, uh, or water skiing at your own hazard. And there was, a, I mean, there was a woman a few years ago who she broke her nose and got a concussion and nearly drowned because she was water skiing in one of those rivers with silver cups. Because when they get stressed, and they do get stressed by the sound of, a, of motor, outboard motors, right? The engine sound, uh, they jump. And they can jump quite high, like flying fish. So you have these pictures of people are just, uh, I mean, they're just sort of uh, out, out boating on the river. Uh, and the boat is slowly filling up with fish just jump on the deck. They seem to be millions of them. So uh, have a look, uh, an interesting case. But the point is it was introduced deliberately in the 1970s, as late as the 1970s. Would this have happened now? No, it wouldn't. So there's been a shift, as I said, there's been a change in the way we think about introducing species, which is quite significant. And which somehow shows that perhaps more or less unconsciously uh, there is a growing awareness of the fact that we live in the Anthropocene um, there is a lot of change around and that uh, we need to take some precautions that in this period and, the, and at this day and age we human being and beings in fact need to introduce some traffic rules otherwise we may end up undermining the conditions for our own existence that's the creeping feeling you know you tamper with nature and night nature strikes back at you <coughs> and um, in a little while in about half an hour you're going to see a film which is also I mean a very powerful film about the Nile perch which is not like the silver carp. I mean, it doesn't jump, okay? Um, it, 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 it's about the same size as me, okay? A fully grown uh, Nile perch is about 180 and, uh, and quite fat, introduced in Lake Victoria for recreational fishing in the 1950s in East Africa. And the film also shows, as I said, the entanglement with, uh, with inequality, with class, uh, with uh, military activities, and with all sorts of uh, politics, local politics. Okay, now on to uh, Tasmania. Unless there's something I've uh, forgotten. Yes, the Monterey pine. And that's the, that's the sort of the, um, the centerpiece, okay, of Leon and Davidson's article is the Monterey pine. And they're problematizing the notion of invasive species quite a bit. The Monterey pine was introduced in Tasmania here in 1894 and, and this, these particular pines that she's uh, writing about were planted then in 1894 um, and, and they, are, they have a, th there's a lot of contention about them there's a lot of controversy for one thing uh, obviously they, they don't belong I mean Monterey uh, a town in California not too far from San Francisco okay, central California so clearly they're not Australian to begin with um, but also, it turned out that this, uh, this, this particular tree, the, center, the central tree in their narrative, was also planted on an 8,000-year-old midden. You know what a midden is? I mean, in Norwegian we say mudding, okay? It's a midden. It's like a, it's like a rubbish dump. Rubbish dump for Aborigines, with lots of uh, remains of sh shellfish. Uh, so, um, 
for certain plants, very nourishing uh, soil. But it was uh, somehow an important place for local Aboriginal groups, which no longer exist. Because, as you would know, uh, Aborigines were driven to extinction. I mean, they were, they were exterminated okay, by, the, uh, by the settlers. So there aren't any uh, Tasmanian Aborigines left, but there are still people who talk on behalf of them, and there would be Aborigines from mainland Australia who are concerned with Aboriginal history throughout the continent. And so uh, is it a good idea to have this, uh, this, this huge tree on top of an 8,000 years old uh, midden? Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, during the last, just the last few decades, as I've pointed out repeatedly, all of a sudden it's become a problem that the tree is not endemic, that it doesn't belong there. So many feel that it should be removed. And Lean and Davidson have an interesting quotation in their article by the famous uh, Australian um, science popularizer, museum director, and popular writer, uh, and environmentalist, Tim Flannery. All right? He's a very important man, I mean, in, uh, in Australian public life. A natural scientist, OK? Um, and, uh, and he was voted Australian of the Year in 2006. They have one person here. And Tim Flannery became Australian of the Year at the time when uh, the environmental sort of pendulum had swung in one direction. It's now swung back. Okay? But there was a strong uh, environmentalist tendency, a lot of worry about climate change and things. And Flannery put words to this. And he somehow also represented the real sort of um, the real Australian, the true Australian man with, a, with, a, with his bush clothes and going out in nature and enjoying uh, Australian scenery. And he says in a speech, poignantly, as, um, as a quote, Leon and Davidson, that nature, in fact, is the only thing that all Australians have in common. Australian nature, you know, with its, all its sort of poisonous uh, snakes and poisonous um, spiders, and uh, with its gum trees and kangaroos and unique, I mean, koalas, all of these unique animals that only exist in Australia, right? So nature is what all Australians have in common, and therefore we should keep it Australian, he says. Right? Uh, and this, uh, this quotation is subject to, to certain, I, I guess, a certain critical um, uh, kind of um, gloss by, uh, by the authors. Um, uh, and I, th I think, you know, personally, I feel that is a little bit unfair, okay? Because what he says is that uh, if we can de decide that nature, the place, is what we have in common, then maybe we can avoid divisive identity politics, right? Or authoritarian assimilationism. You know, assimilationism, everybody should be like me. And if you're going to live in Australia, you're going to have to learn the Australian way of life, right? Which is uh, the barbie, the beer, the beach, uh, and a few basic blokey activities. Otherwise, you're not going to be a real Australian. You know, that's, the, that's one, one sort of attitude that you find, okay? I'm not saying that it's universal. I'm not even saying that it's widespread. But it's a form of assimilation. It's just as they say about people who come to Norway. If you don't do cross-country skiing, I mean, forget about becoming integrated. And as I, my, my big advice, this is just a footnote, my big advice to foreigners who come to Norway and to immigrants is that um, never, don't worry about language or race or ethnicity or religion, that sort of thing. As long as you go out in nature, uh, it's, it melts the heart of the Norwegians. And especially in winter, cross-country skiing. It doesn't really matter if you don't speak a word of the language, you're one of us. Okay? And in Australia, there's a similar attitude, there's a similar relationship to nature. Because uh, there's no deep cultural history, and the deep cultural history they have, they can't relate to. Majority of Australians are in incapable of relating properly to it, because it's Aboriginal. And it's, uh, it's so fraught, no matter what you say. And, I mean, Tim Flannery has also been the victim of this. No matter what you say about Aborigines, someone is going to set you right, because y y you said the wrong thing. So it's, it's incredibly fraught, unless you're Aborig even if you're Aborigine yourself. Other Aborigines are going to disagree with what you say. So, uh, so that's, that's difficult, and, uh, and convict history is not a big deal for them. I mean, uh, to brag about being the descendant of convicts who came a couple of hundred years ago, it's also something that doesn't give you a sense of glory uh, to, to many Australians. So they have a few things to relate to, and one of them is nature, and probably that's the most important one. Just as uh, uh, during Norwegian nation building in the 19th century, one of the few things that they had in Norway that they didn't have in the neighboring countries was spectacular nature, waterfalls, mountains, wilderness, bears, wolves. The Danes didn't have anything. Denmark was all flat, right? And Sweden was very urbanized and centralized and sort of European, okay? And hierarchical. And notice this. I mean, um, those of you who are not Norwegian, I mean, notice when you travel around rural Norway, um, you don't see a single castle. <laughs> 
There's not because there aren't any. There wasn't a nobility here. There were some semi nobles in the in this part of the country, but not really a nobility. We didn't have an aristocracy. Whereas when you drive through central or southern Sweden, which is much flatter, much more fertile, which gives a basis for much larger surplus in the economy, you'll notice that about about every five kilometers or so you have to stop and look at the castle. Right? Uh, because they're, they're, they're all over the place. So feudalism was not developed here. So nature, and nature in Australia, very important. And I think what Flannery really says is that he's referring, perhaps unconsciously, and certainly obliquely, indirectly, to a major distinction in the theory of nationalism between le droit du sol and le, le droit du son. Le droit du sol, the right of the soil, of the land. You belong because you live in the same place. Right? Um, Droit du sang, the right of the blood. You belong because you have the same ancestors as the other people who also belong. In other words, if you live in the right place but you have the wrong an ancestors, you don't belong. But if you have the wrong ancestors and live in the right place, you can belong if you, if you subscribe to, to le, le droit du sol. Uh, the, the, and uh, in, in French uh, nation building and French national identity, this has been a fairly strong force. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't always work. There's a lot of racism and discrimination in France. But this, uh, as a matter of principle, if you're born in France, you can be French. That's a republican idea, which is not an ethnic idea. And I think what Flannery tried to say when referring to nature was something along those lines. But surely uh, there is also Puritanism here. Uh, eradicating South African uh, shrubs, getting rid of all the foreign plants, uh, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you might say, biological cleansing. Not ethnic cleansing, uh, but biological cleansing. And they mention, um, you know, the banana, the passion fruit, and the South African ivy as uh, some of the culprits that uh, one now tries to get rid of, which were deliberately introduced maybe just a few decades ago. So th it's, it's, it's changed quite quickly. And then, they, uh, and then there was um, this interesting conflict over the pine trees that they, uh, that they described, which I think is well taken. For one thing, uh, as the Australian anthropologist David Trigger has pointed out, he's quoted in the article, uh, Aborigines tend to take, at least he says, I'm not sure if he's right, he says, Aborigines tend to take a more relaxed and more fluid and flexible view of the past so that they're not worried about change in the same way. Certain forms of changes, of course, the changes that have driven them from the land. I mean, for one thing, I mean, the land has been stolen from them. But other forms of changes, such as new plants coming, new animals coming in. Uh, he says, well, it, it's, if, to them, it's not, it's not, really, it's not really so important. Um, whereas many of the um, white Australians were deeply concerned and wanted to get rid of the, of the pine trees. Uh, but then, one of her informants, I mean, you notice that, I mean, there are two sort of main informants who are given the word, given the floor in the, in the article. One of them says, predictably perhaps, that the pine trees should be taken away because they weren't there at the time of Captain Cook's arrival, so they don't really belong. Whereas the other says that, and she problematizes this, you know, what part of the, what are you looking at when you talk about the past? Uh, if you just look at a certain segment of the, of the second hand, then maybe the early 20th century could count as the past. I mean, when was the past, right? I've been asking this question earlier during this course. When was the past? Did it have to be um, in the dim and distant mythical past? Or could the past be just a few generations ago? So maybe the late 19th century was the past. And this tree, which is a big majestic tree, and those other trees nearby, which are also, uh, uh, also uh, from, uh, from California, maybe they have grown to belong. And can you see here the parallel in which one talks about belonging in modern complex societies? I mean, <coughs> I don't know, is it too far-fetched? Is it just me? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> is it too far-fetched to think about belonging in Western European societies? When the uh, Norwegian Bureau of Statistics, Statistics Norway, w when they uh, do their classification of the uh, people who live here, um, you have a distinction, obviously, between various kinds of people, <coughs> excuse me, among many lines. You have age, gender, place of residence. Do people live in a city, a town, or, or in a rural area? North, south, east, west. But you also have an ethnic classification, right? Um, uh, and uh, you have immigrants, which is fair enough. Immigrants are people who were not born here. That's very, it's very easy. In other words, a king is an immigrant. Um, and... Um, and then you have second generation immigrants who are now called descendants, right? Which makes many people of the second generation feel that, uh, I mean, 
pardon my French, I mean, shit, when are they going to allow us to belong here? You know, I've never been anywhere else. And they call me a, an immigrant, you know? Well, or descendant now, but second generation immigrant is fairly common. But what about the third generation? What about them? If we think about the, this Tasmanian tree in terms of those classifications, how do we classify the past? When did the present begin? Uh, and how far back do you have to go in order to find your ancestors? I believe I've mentioned to you before uh, this example again from Mauritius. Um, and if I have, if I have I'll, I'll repeat it because it somehow connects to this debate about self, other, present, past, authentic, inauthentic, which is what we're talking about here. I'm not saying that don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that getting rid of a pine tree or getting rid of South African ivy is the same as uh, ethnic cleansing. I'm not saying it's the same thing, okay? It's not the same thing. But what's interesting to us as anthropologists who study classification is that they relate to similar forms of classification and that there is a Mary Douglas uh, dimension here to do with the inside, the outside, the boundary, the pure and the impure, right? <coughs> and that which belongs and that which doesn't belong. Uh, so, uh, for example, I mean, regarding the dingo in Australia, uh, it is said, you know, I went on holiday with my son, okay, when he visited me in February to Fraser Island, which is, a, which is an island off the coast of Queensland, up here, uh, and they brag about the fact that they probably have the purest raised dingoes in all of Australia, the purest dingoes, which are not interbred, okay, with domestic dogs. Which, so that, that sort of marketing leaves you feeling a little bit uneasy. I mean, it's just about dingoes, but it's about a way of thinking about the world, purity versus impurity, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which may feed into other ways of talking. And in fact, Lean and Davids refer to um, a very important Lebanese-Australian anthropologist called Ghassan Haj, uh, okay? Ghassan Haj, who's writing about race and nationalism. So they do make the connection themselves. But perhaps wisely, they don't make a lot out of it. So, um, in other words, when was the past? What is pure? What is impure? So there is a parallel somehow here. I'm not saying it's the same thing. There's a parallel between the discourse about invasive species uh, and, uh, and the debate on hybridity and creolization and mixing, cultural mixing, and uh, impurities and matter out of place. Maybe we shouldn't take it too far. Uh, but uh, one, could, one could keep it in mind. And perhaps m even more importantly, uh, what, what this literature is doing and what I've really been doing in the course of this lecture, although I've mostly told stories about invasive species, is to problematize the boundary between nature and culture, right? I'm not saying that everything is the same, okay? And that uh, trees have uh, intentions, that trees have behavior, that they want things. They really want to burn, you know? Uh, because uh, otherwise they can't propagate. I mean, certain eucalypts need bushfires in order to, uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to spread. But I'm, I'm not saying this, okay? Uh, but that the uh, idea that there is something which is culture and something which is nature uh, is problematized through the, uh, uh, the fact of, of species invasion. Because what is it really? As I said, a feral pig used to be domestic, no longer domestic. We brought it here. It's not really wild. It's not really tame. What is it? Uh, okay, and there is a quotation in Lean and Davidson article, which I, I'll read out to you, which goes like this. A new literature is emerging, showing that cities, long thought of as quintessentially unnatural spaces, are thoroughly shaped by non-human agencies and populated by non-human bodies, and deserve to be thought of as nature as much as wilderness deserves to be thought of as culture. Now, that's a fairly strong statement. Cities are just as much nature as wilderness is culture. I wouldn't take it this far, okay? But it's an interesting, because it's so extreme, it's an interesting sentence, right? Um, the point is here that these things are entangled with each other. That there's a lot of nature in a city. If you look, raccoons in, uh, in San Francisco, rats all over the place, fungi, uh, plants, uh, I mean pot plants in the African slums, etc. There's a lot of nature. Fleas and so on. Anyway, uh, I was going to talk about the, um, the other article as well, uh, but I can only give you the uh, main points uh, by, by Anna Willow, which is also a very interesting article because the, uh, the, the, the setting here is the emerald ash borer, which is a, a nasty uh, piece of work. For the, uh, it's about bad news for the, uh, for the black ash. The black ash, right? It's a tree, right? It's a tree, right? the black ash, which is used for various uh, purposes. It's used as firewood, it's for building houses, 
and it's also used in basket weaving by uh, Native Americans, by Indian groups which live in the Northeast. This, we're talking here about northeastern parts of the United States, Quebec, Ontario, or, or sort of some of the southeastern parts of, uh, of Canada. Uh, and this uh, emerald ash borer, and that's also one of the sort of shocking things about species simulation, is that it can sometimes, sometimes it doesn't take very long. It was unknown in the area before 2002. Okay, that's not such a long time. I mean, to me, that was yesterday, you know. But I'm a bit older than you, okay? But 2002 is not such a long time ago. And by 2011, after nine years, it was uh, observed in 15 states and two Canadian provinces. So it spread quite quickly. And it spreads through transportation. It spreads like a virus. Um, but it can also spread on its own accord, but much more slowly. And this is why transportation and not just by sea but also by land, is so important uh, for an understanding of both globalization and, uh, and the un its un unintentional side effects, such as, um, such as the spreading of, um, uh, of, the, of the emerald ash borer. Um, now the point, about her, uh, the point in her article is really that indigenous communities are finding ways of um, co-opting or assimilating um, modern knowledge, more than scientific knowledge, about how to deal with it um, without somehow ceasing to be indigenous. She has a quotation, and I'll end by that because uh, there is a slight misunderstanding there which I think needs to be rectified. It's an excellent article, but there's a small misunderstanding there. When she refers to a book by Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger called The Invention of Tradition, right? And she says that traditions are being invented rather than being static and fixed. That's not really what Hobsbawm and Ranger are saying, but it's true. Traditions evolve, and uh, you can perfectly well change a tradition if you, if you can do it on your own terms. And that's what's been happening there. That's how they've been able to assimilate um, Western ideas, Western scientific ideas. And one cannot help thinking about the Ebola ep epidemic in this respect, can, can one? Uh, what would have been a useful way of assimilating Western science in the traditional way of going about things? In, in the upper, the, on the upper Guinea coast in order to prevent Ebola because there is a contrast there. Many people make a contrast between our way of life and those white people and the state's way of life which we don't trust. We don't trust their knowledge. Uh, so here you find uh, ways in these uh, Native American communities to find ways of trusting, as it were, the state and the white man's knowledge without ceasing to be um, indigenous. But <clears throat> the misunderstanding is that what Hob Hobsbawm and Ranger are concerned with are traditions which are being deliberately created in order to give the impression of being very old. Modern traditions which uh, give a semblance of being old. I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I was giving a lecture about Hobsbawm and Ranger some years ago and on the evening before I didn't quite know sort of what the, what the, how to get into it, you know, uh, how to start. And then I went into a pub in Malmö in southern Sweden with some friends, okay? And uh, that pub had been made to look as if it were 100 years old, but it was brand new. You see what I mean? Everything uh, in it made it appear to be 100 years old with all decorations on the wall. And, but there was one thing that gave it away. There was none of that sort of old lingering tobacco smell, okay? It smelled fresh and <laughs> new. And, recently painted. But that's an invented tradition, something which is new but pretends to be old. Uh, a typical invented tradition in our part of the world around here would be the Bunad, the Norwegian folk dress, uh, which were, most of the Norwegian folk dresses were designed by Hulda Geiborg, a writer, intellectual, the wife of Arne Geiborg, another writer, uh, at the, uh, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, with the explicit aim of creating a folk, a, a folk tradition that gave an attachment to history and to the land and to place. Of course, the, it was inspired by older um, traditions, both in Norway and elsewhere, not least by folk dresses in Central Europe, um, in the Alps and so on. Uh, but uh, but it was, that's, an, that's an invented tradition. So what, what uh, Willow is talking about is not really an invented tradition. It's rather about adapting, adjusting, making smaller uh, changes to a tradition in order to uh, adjust to, uh, to a new world. So, um, so what have I been saying? Well, I guess what I've been trying to show today is that the, you might say the first the introduction, the spread, and then the attempts to control and eradicate uh, alien introduced or invasive species, if we prefer that term, it reveals both a shift in the mentality, it's a shift in the attitude towards boundaries, mobility, that it has become a threat 
uh, rather than um, uh, rather than uh, uh, possibility, at least in in some um, aspects, and also trying to show that how this is uh, in fact. Uh, much neglected by anthropologists and other social sciences, but important part of, uh, of human history and of globalization. And now, um, yep, uh, to in Auditorium 5? Auditorium 5, so in 10 minutes. Yep. Great. Okay, so see you next week. <laughs>